All right, let us go on. Now back to section three on convergence theorems and let us do some preliminary investigations. Basically, in this section, I want to do a lot of warm-up exercises which uh, give us intuition and um, methods and um, example knowledge that we can need later for more general proofs. And the first is on integration sectors. for labeled forests. As you remember, we introduced the notion of labeled maximal forests, where we have these labels for different lines in subgraphs, and then each labeled forest and uh, the labeled lines define an integration region. And these integration regions are defined by certain inequalities, which are more adapted to subgraph structure and to renormalization than this simple-minded uh, sectors that we used in our simple convergence theorem, where we simply ordered all the alphas from one to i uh, with nothing, uh, no deeper structure. But the integration sectors that we get from the labeled forests uh, involve inequalities between the alphas, which are adapted to subgraph and nested and non-overlapping subgraph structures. And uh, these integration sectors span the full alpha space, and uh, they are essentially disjoint, as we discussed and as we have proven. So we can split up an integral over all the alphas into these different sectors. And um, let us now look at the behavior of these different sectors. And let's do it for an example. I wanted to do a for loop example. So it is again the same structure of graphs. Don't get confused, there are also Feynman diagrams which look different from these letter type diagrams that I always draw. But uh, they are simple to draw and um, they are good for illustrating the general principles. So this is now our graph G that we consider. And now let us directly do the example for the graph and then in the end draw some general conclusions which follow in an obvious way, hopefully. So I would define now a maximal labeled forest out of subgraphs. Let us do the following. So here one subgraph here, the left triangle. This is our first subgraph. And let's take as a label simply the upper line here. Then our next subgraph is this two-loop graph here. And uh, let's take as a label this line. And the third subgraph would be nested. So the right triangle as an example. Let's take this as a label, just for simplicity. Then we have basically all possibilities in this for loop graph. We have disjoint subgraphs in our forest. We have nested subgraphs in our forests. And uh, these are the two possibilities which exist. And so that is why I chose this for loop graph, because it illustrates everything that can happen in general. We have defined a label, so let's also use this as the label of our full graph. And so now, if you remember, a maximal forest is a set of a maximal set of disjoint or nested subgraphs, and including the full graph. So here we have a subgraph H1, the red one, a subgraph H2, the blue one, a subgraph H3, uh, the yellow one, and the full graph G. Each maximal forest contains as many elements as there are loops. So here there are four elements, H1, H2, H3, and the full graph G. Each has a label. Let's say alpha 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 
10, 11. Why did I not? Why did I not have 11 lines in my? Oh, interesting. I used the number 10 twice anyway. Um, okay, so we have 11 lines in our graph. Let's denote the alphas like this. Yes. Um, has the, the blue graph also like that? Yep. Okay. It got uh, overwritten by yellow. Yes, the blue graph must contain line 7, otherwise um, it wouldn't be a maximal forest with nested subgraphs. Yes, indeed. So the blue graph is a two-loop graph. Okay, now let us define this integration sector D. So maybe just to make it clear. So G, the forest C in this notation contains G, H1, H2, H3. Four elements, the labels are sigma of G is three, sigma of H1 is one, sigma of H2, uh, sorry, sigma of three, G is two, sigma of H2 is three, sigma of H3 is four. So then we can now define our integration sector. Curly D, which is defined by this labeled forest C and the labeling sigma. So we get inequalities. What are the inequalities that we get? For each subgraph, we get an inequality. So let's begin with the smallest subgraph which is H1. So the subgraph H1, the red subgraph on the left, gives us the labeled line alpha 2, uh, sorry, alpha 1 is bigger or equal than all the other lines in the subgraph. So alpha 1 is bigger or equal than alpha 5 and alpha 8. Then the next smallest subgraph H2, no, we should take H3 first. H3 is the one loop subgraph, yellow on the right. The label is alpha 4. So the rule says alpha 4 is bigger or equal than all the alphas in the yellow subgraph, bigger or equal than alpha 7 and alpha 11. Then H2, the label is alpha 3. Alpha 3 is bigger or equal than all the other alphas in the subgraph. So alpha 3 is bigger or equal than alpha 6 and alpha 10. And bigger than all the yellow lines, in particular bigger than alpha 4. And then automatically it's also bigger than alpha 7 and alpha 11. Then graph G, the label is alpha Two. So alpha 2 should be bigger or equal than all the other alphas, in particular bigger than alpha 9, which is the only other alpha not contained in any subgraph, and then bigger than all the other labels, so bigger than alpha 1, bigger than alpha 4, and bigger than alpha 3. And then automatically uh, alpha 2 is also bigger than everything. Yes, that's what I meant. So I can include them, but I don't have to because alpha 4 is already here and uh, they are smaller or equal than alpha 4. That's why you can add them or not. Uh, either way, they are automatically smaller. Likewise here, I don't have to write down all the other alphas because they are automatically contained by this chain of inequalities. So this is an integration sector, and as we discussed, the full alpha integration can be split into many such sectors if we scan overall possibilities for labeled forests. Then we get the full alpha integration. So we, uh, in order to study convergence and renormalization, we only need to look at each sector individually. 
And so let us now look at one such sector. And uh, I chose the sector such that it contains all the possibilities. As I said, disjoint subgraphs, nested subgraphs, everything happens. So now what we do, each time we have such a sector, we use uh, clever integration variables as we did in the exercise. So what are the integration variables perfectly adapted to this particular sector? The strategy is to single out all the alphas which appear on the right hand side. In other words, all the labeled alphas. They get integration variables that we call T. They characterize then the individual subgraphs. So for each subgraph, there will be one integration variable T characteristic for it. And then all the other alphas in the subgraph are smaller than this variable T. And they will be called beta. So we have a hierarchy of variables, some variables T, and the remaining variables beta. And uh, okay, so let's do it for the example. Let's say Ti for each um, gamma element of the forest, including the full graph, beta i for the rest. Let's just do it for the concrete example. So here we would say, let us start with the biggest graph, g. So we introduce a variable tg square. We also introduce always the square. tg square is alpha 2. Um, sorry, I need to change the batteries again, but not this one. So you can already think uh, what you think are reasonable variables. So we introduce one TG square for uh, the biggest alpha that we have in our sector. And of course, in the integration range, this runs from zero to infinity. Then for the next subgraph, H1, we introduce a variable. Let's call it simply T1 square. And uh, then we say, uh, Let's, let's, uh, this does not look very nice. So alpha 2 is equal to Tg square. And then the variable for our first subgraph, alpha 1, we write it as Tg square times T1 square. Then T1 runs from 0 to 1, and we have implemented the inequality between the biggest alpha and uh, the labeled alpha for the red subgraph. Then the next subgraph is um, H2. So this is the two-loop subgraph, the blue one. And it has a label alpha 3. And as you said yesterday in the exercise, the right thing to uh, do is to think about what are the inequalities affecting alpha 3. And the inequality affecting alpha 3 is only that it must be smaller than alpha 2. So we write it as Tg square times T2 square. And then we have implemented this inequality, and uh, T2 runs from 0 to 1. Right? So now. now uh, square variable corresponding to alpha 3 as well? Yes, T2 square. Oh, okay. So I call it T2 because it's the subgraph H2. And then also H3. So H3 has two inequalities because the labeled alpha for this um, yellow one loop subgraph, alpha 4, it must be smaller than alpha 3, first of all. And alpha 3 in turn must be smaller than alpha 2. 
So we write this as T3 square times T2 square times T3 square. And then we have implemented, if T3 runs from 0 to 1, this implements the inequality alpha 4 smaller or equal than alpha 3, and that is smaller or equal than alpha 2. So lo and behold, for each subgraph in our forest, we introduce one variable t, which implements the inequalities on the level of the subgraphs. So this is the correct choice here for this forest, and of course you can always do it like this. And uh, I deliberately have all the cases. So if you have disjoint subgraphs, here these are disjoint subgraphs, uh, red and blue disjoint, both of them are smaller than the big graph, but they are independent, so each of them gets an independent variable t1 and t2, which runs from 0 to 1. So there is no particular ordering between these two alphas, but each of them is smaller than that. And we have nested subgraphs, so the yellow is nested inside the blue, and therefore this looks like this, so we have a chain of products of t's for the nested subgraph compared to the one it lies within. So these are all the cases which can appear in general. So you can always do it for a labeled forest to introduce such a set of t variables, one t for each subgraph, and then you write the alphas in this way. What is the integration measure? So d alpha 2, d alpha, um, okay, no, let's, let's not, sorry, let's not do it yet. Let's do it only if we have everything, because now we do the rest for the remaining variables. What do we do with the remaining variables? So for the remaining variables, we have to look again at their inequalities. So the remaining variables in the big graph is only alpha 9. Alpha 9 satisfies only one inequality. It must be smaller or equal than alpha 2. So we write alpha 9 which is not labeled as this t g square times beta 9. And here I don't put a square. So then beta runs from 0 to 1, and we have uh, applied the inequality. Then the non-labeled line in the subgraph H1, the red one, this is alpha 5 and alpha 8. So we write this as t g square t1 square times beta 5 or beta 8. Then again, the betas run from 0 to 1, and we have implemented the inequality specific for the subgraph H1. Then uh, for the subgraph H3, we have uh, sorry, for the subgraph H2, uh, the blue subgraph, we have the lines alpha 6 and alpha 10 which are not labeled, and so they are smaller or equal than the labeled line alpha 3, so we write them as t g square t2 square times beta 6 or beta 10. And finally, the remaining lines in the yellow graph are alpha 7 and alpha 11. They are written like this, t g square t2 square t3 square times beta 7 or beta 11. So long story short, you can always do it like this. For each subgraph, you get a variable t. And for the remaining non-labeled lines, you get variables beta. And we put them just without a square directly. And uh, so now, the integration range is tg runs from 0 to infinity. And all the other ti and beta i run from 0 to 1. And what is the integration measure? Product of all the d alpha i is now equal to the product of all the t's, t i, and all the product of all the beta i's times what? So what is the factor that we pick up? So which factor do we pick up in terms of the variable tg? tg appears everywhere. It is the biggest variable. So it is the scaling variable for all the alphas. Each alpha is proportional to tg squared. So from um, the integration measure, 
once we get two times Tg from the derivative, so we get the two times Tg, and from all the other alpha uh, transformations, we get Tg squared, so we get Tg to the power two times the number of lines minus one. This is the factor of Tg that we pick up. And here in this case, we have 11 internal lines, so we get some appropriate power. What is the factor of the other t's that we get? So for example, t1. So for t1, t1 appears where? t1 appears here in the alpha 1 integration, and from this measure transformation, we get 2 times t1. And then here for each of those lines, uh, alpha 5 and alpha 8, we also get a T1 square from the measure transformation. So we get, uh, from these two transformations, we get T1 to the fourth, and here we get two times T1. So overall, we get two times T1 to the fifth power. What is T1 to the fifth power? This is exactly the number of lines in the subgraph one times two minus one. So this is two times the number of lines in H1 minus one. And that is clear, because T1 appears in every line in the red subgraph. And so from the measure transformation, we pick up exactly this factor. And so on. So what about T2? T2 appears in the blue subgraph, and every blue line gets a factor T2 square. And so from the measure transformation, we pick up once a derivative 2 times T2. And uh, for all the other lines, we pick up T2 square, so we get two times the number of lines in the subgraph H2 minus 1. And so on. So for T3, we get T3 times 2 times to the power 2 I number of lines in the subgraph H3 minus 1. And from the betas, we get nothing because uh, they are introduced linearly without a square. So this is the measure transformation. So to write it in a more compact way, we get product of all the dTi's, product of all the d beta i's, times two to which power? We get two to the number of loops. Because for each loop, we have a t, and for each t, we get a factor of two. So two to the number of loops of the original graph g. Then each t, product of all the t's, each t comes to a power two times uh, the number of internal lines in the subgraph hi minus one. And so hi is meant in a general way, ti is also meant in a general way, so we also have tg, which is then the full graph, and h1, h2, h3. Okay. This is exactly the measure transformation. And clearly, you can always do it like this. This is just an example. But uh, the system is clear. And the formula that we obtained here applies for every labeled forest. I think I have a problem with batteries, because these batteries are also empty. Now, uh, um, now I think we have to make a bigger break. Sorry about that. Uh, but we have reached a satisfactory point. Let me switch this off for a moment and uh, get some more. OK, so this is what we obtained. We have now uh, defined a specific integration sector with a certain set of inequalities. Adapted to this sector, we have introduced new optimal variables. We determined the uh, transformation of the integration measure. And now we want to determine the behavior of the semantic polynomial of the graph inside of this sector. So with which power does it depend on which variable? And that is what we can now determine using our detailed power counting lemma from before. All right.
So this was our Feynman graph, and the question is, what happens if we take the semantic polynomial of this graph and plug in all these variables? And so now what we know immediately is something from our simple power counting lemma. Namely, our simple power counting lemma tells us if we scale all variables in this subgraph H1 by a common factor, the overall semantic polynomial behaves like uh, that variable T, uh, in that case T1, to the appropriate power uh, of the number of loops, to, to the power L1. And uh, our simple power counting lemma simply told us that each term in the polynomial scales like this or like higher powers of this variable. So this is the simple result. So uh, to write it simply, I simply say t to the power bigger or equal than two times the number of loops in this first subgraph. And that is clear for the overall semantic polynomial and for each individual term. Similarly, if we take the subgraph two, which is the two loop subgraph, each term behaves like t2 to the power bigger or equal than two times the number of loops in that subgraph. Likewise, for t3, each term behaves like this. And by the way, this number is one, this is two, and uh, the number of loops in subgraph three is again uh, one. And we have the overall variable. Each term behaves at least as uh, two times the number of loops in the full graph, which is four. So this is true for each term. So for this, we do not need any more detailed uh, information. So, but now we can do a more detailed investigation and look at the uh, uh, individual terms with minimum powers of the t's. So actually, our semantic polynomial uh, is homogeneous in all the alphas again. So uh, actually, this inequality is not necessary. So this is uh, too conservative. Actually, we know precisely that the semantic polynomial is proportional to four powers of alphas, and therefore we can scale out the overall Tg to the power eight times the same semantic polynomial where we have set the t variable Tg to one. So I don't write all the arguments, I only write the argument which uh, is special. So this is the argument corresponding to the variable alpha two, which has been set to Tg. This variable is now one. And the variable Tg doesn't appear here anymore. Okay? So this is clear from the overall homogeneity. Now we look especially at our subgraph H1, which is the left triangle graph here. All the variables in that triangle subgraph scale with T1, or T1 square. And so we now know that uh, the semantic polynomial can be written as this, Tg to the eighth power. And then from here, we can scale out all uh, the lines from the subgraph H1, and then we obtain T1 to the number of loops, so to the power two here in this case, because it's a one loop subgraph, times. And now we know in detail, we get the semantic polynomial, semantic polynomial for the subgraph H1. And in this semantic polynomial, we now put a one in place of this variable where T1 was, and that was the variable alpha one. So it's now a special uh, evaluation of the semantic polynomial where one alpha is put to one because we have scaled out the, alpha, uh, the T2 square factor. And then what remains is the semantic polynomial for the reduced graph, 
G divided by H1 with all the remaining alphas. They have never depended on T1, but they all depended on T3, and that has factored out. So the variables which appear here are only the other variables, the other Ts and the betas. And then we get plus higher orders. Higher orders which are consistent with this uh, general knowledge, so we don't need to determine it, but uh, we want to determine the coefficient of the lowest orders in T. And so here we know something. Now we go on. So now we can treat, uh, so this is now a single one loop semantic polynomial where one alpha is one. What is the value of a semantic polynomial of a one loop graph with one alpha being equal to one? So in general, the semantic polynomial of a one loop graph is just the sum of all the alphas. It's just the sum of all the alphas. Because the loop momentum appears uh, equally in all the lines and the semantic polynomial is the uh, prefactor of all the loop momentum square, so this is just the sum of all the alphas. So that is the sum of all the arguments, which is one plus some other variables. Therefore, if all the variables go to zero, this goes to one. That is important. So we could also say this is one plus higher orders in all the variables. And we will do that later. Okay, but now we have to treat the remaining semantic polynomial, which is the semantic polynomial for this graph. And this contains now still the two-loop subgraph and nested the one-loop subgraph. So now I'll treat the big two-loop subgraph in that one. So then we know the semantic polynomial for this graph. We, we have eliminated the left triangle and we look at the big two-loop subdiagram. How does this behave? So it by itself uh, has now a two-loop subdiagram, and we look at uh, the case where all the two-loop variables scale with a common factor t2 square, and then we get t2 to the fourth power, because we get t2 to the power of two times the loops in the subdiagram, which is t2 to the fourth power. And then we obtain the semantic polynomial of the subgraph h2, and out of this semantic polynomial, we have again factored out the variable t2 square. So one of the alphas in this semantic polynomial is set to one. Which one? Namely alpha three. Alpha three is set to one, and all the other uh, alphas in the subdiagram H2 have now some values which are determined by the betas. Then what remains is the reduced graph, G reduced by uh, the union H1 union with H2. So this is the subgraph which contains only of this square. And we can actually write what it is. So this depends really only on um, the variables of these two lines here. So this depends only on the one which was uh, the alpha 2. And it depends on the line number nine. I think this was line number nine. And this is given by beta nine. Okay, so this semantic polynomial of this reduced graph has only two variables. One of them is one and the other one is beta nine. And so the value of this is one plus beta nine. Plus higher orders. Then, in a similar way, we treat now the nested subgraph, H3. This is a nested subgraph inside of this H2. So, about this semantic polynomial of H2, we know something else. The semantic polynomial of H2, actually, one of the alphas was set to 1, namely the alpha 3 was set to 1. So, we are talking about this subdiagram here, so alpha 3 was set to one already, but then we still have this subgraph 
corresponding to the right triangle. And now we scale down all the triangle subgraph with a variable T3, so we get T3 square because we have one loop in the subgraph, so we can factor out T3 square for this subgraph. And what remains is the semantic polynomial for the subgraph, H1. And in the subgraph, we have now one variable one. So the label alpha four has been set to one because we have factored out the corresponding variable. And what are the other variables of this subgraph? We can now be complete. So this is line number 11 and this is line number seven. So it depends on one, beta seven, and beta 11. And actually the value is one plus beta seven plus beta 11 times the semantic polynomial of the reduced graph. And this is now the graph where we reduce the two loop subdiagram and we shrink the one loop triangle to a point. So we get this square subdiagram here. And uh, we have basically already factored out almost everything. So the line, it depends on alpha two. So this is alpha, sorry, alpha three, four, five, six, um, and 10. So it has the entries one, beta six, and beta 10 to be complete, plus higher orders. So, and now we are done. So if we combine everything, then we get a formula for our semantic polynomial u in this integration sector. Step by step, we have factored out all the t's for each subgraph, nested or disjoint, and uh, overall we have picked up the following factors. So each t comes out to the power of two times the number of loops. Here, t to the power eight, t2 to the power four, t1 and t3 to the power two. So let's write it down, t3 to the power eight, t1 to the power two, t2 to the power four, t3 to the power two. Times what? Now what is uh, now happening in the remaining factor? We always get products of semantic polynomials plus higher orders higher orders in uh, all the t's, or at least in some of the t's. So, and uh, okay, we could write down now the product of the semantic polynomials. Maybe I uh, will do it. So what we get is semantic polynomial for the subgraph H1. And uh, if you want, we can be absolutely complete. So the subgraph H1 depends on the following variables. So one of the alphas is set to one, and the other variables are beta um, eight and beta five times the subgraph H1. From here, with variables one, beta seven, and beta 11 times the subgraph H2 divided by H1, which is this remaining square where this line has been shrunk to a point. So this depends on the variables one, beta six, and beta 10, times the semantic polynomial for the full graph where we shrink to a point the union H1 and H2, and this depends on the variables one and beta nine, plus higher orders. Okay, so here we have it. This is our decomposition of the semantic polynomial, so we can factor out all the t's with appropriate powers, and what remains are reduced semantic polynomials which only depend on betas and ones. And therefore, uh, zooming out a little bit, all we have here is one plus higher orders in the betas. 
So even if all the betas go to zero, this goes to one. And then we have higher orders in all the variables. So we can probably generalize this. In general, we can decompose the alpha integral into these sectors corresponding to labeled maximal forests in each sector you can define variables p let's say gamma where gamma can be any element of the maximal forest including the full graph so as many as there are loops for each loop you get one t variable and beta i for the non-labeled lines then the integration measure scales like this product of all the d alphas is converted into a product of let's say all the betas times let's say uh, the betas how many betas are there so th here there are as many alphas as there are overall internal lines there are as many betas as there are internal lines minus the number of loops and then there are as many t's as there are loops and then we get factor 2 to the power of the loops in the graph and then we get the product of all the t's let's say um, let's say gamma element of the forest then t comes to the power two times the number of loops in that appropriate subgraph minus one that is the change of the integration measure and the semantic polynomial u can be written in the following form product of all the t's the gamma element of the forest and then here each t comes to the factor t gamma uh, two times the number of loops in the subgraph again times a remaining function let's call it d tilde and what do we know about d tilde? d tilde is a polynomial in t's and betas and it is equal to 1 plus higher orders in all the t's and the betas We can also maybe make it even nicer. So in combination, what we have is actually the integral over all the alphas. And then semantic polynomial appears to the power minus d over 2. So what happens with this expression? So we get from this an integral, sorry. Integral over many betas and then an integral over all the t's d t gamma 
And uh, what is now the behavior of the integrand? So each t gamma appears with a which power? So we get uh, two times the number of By the way, I think I made a mistake here. Uh, sorry. Let's go back. Let's back up. Uh, what is actually here the power of the t's? This is not. Uh, I don't know what I said before. But in the integration measure, uh, we do not get the number of loops, but we get the number of lines. I, I don't remember what I said in our explicit example, but we should have seen that each t comes for each line, we get a t. Therefore, what we have here in the integration measure is not a number of loops at all, but we have the number of lines in the subgraph gamma. So we have here the number of internal lines in the subgraph gamma. I hope uh, we did it correctly for the actual example. Because for each line, we get this transformation from alphas to betas and t's. So the two appears to the number of loops because for each t we get a factor two and there are as many t's as there are loops. But then from all the integration transformations we get each t to the power of um, the internal lines, minus one. Okay, and now this uh, is nice because if we look at each individual t, each individual t appears to this power, two times the number of internal lines in the subgraph minus one. And then from the semantic polynomial to the power minus d over 2, we get uh, minus d times the number of loops in the subgraph gamma. So this is all in the product. And then this goes times the remaining d tilde to the power minus d over 2. And now you see the integration over t is uh, basically power-like. Uh, for each individual t, you, we have factored the integrand. And for each variable t, we get it to uh, an appropriate power which corresponds to power counting of the subdiagram. Because what we have here again is two times the lines in the subdiagram minus d times the number of loops in the subdiagram. And this combination is exactly the degree of divergence of the subdiagram gamma. So each variable t behaves uh, like the power counting of the corresponding subdiagram suggests. And what remains in the integrand is this function d tilde to that power. And this depends still on everything, but in lowest order it's one. Therefore, if all the variables go to zero in the integration, then this is a regular function. It goes to unity and doesn't uh, matter for discussing the divergences. It matters for the finite result, of course, but it doesn't matter for the divergences. So the divergences result now from this t integration, and uh, that one can discuss and uh, use for studying divergences and convergence. So this happens now for each individual sector, and um, that we can make use eventually in um, a general discussion. Okay, so now we have reached uh, this understanding of power counting. So we have already made uh, a lot of breaks, sorry for that. But actually here, now we have really reached a point where we can make a break. Um, relax for a moment and let me clean the blackboard. Do you have any questions to this?
Okay, can we go on? Okay. Let's go on. Uh, as our next preliminary investigation, let us look at a specific divergent integral, which is motivated by what we just found, namely by these t integrals, which diverge at t going to zero in a power law manner. So let's look first at this simple integral where we integrate up to delta to one, let's say dt, t to the power minus one. So this is a logarithmically divergent integral degree of divergence zero, and uh, the result of the integral is simply a logarithm of t at the limits one and delta, so we get logarithm minus logarithm of delta. And uh, that goes to infinity if delta goes to zero. So we have a logarithmic divergence. This is how we often think about such integrals. And what we should now uh, change in our way of thinking is we shouldn't uh, think in terms of a lower integration limit, delta which goes to zero, but we will always integrate down to zero, but what changes is the exponent here. So in dimensional regularization, uh, which we use uh, to define those integrals, what happens instead is we integrate from zero to one, dt, and then we have here t to the power minus one plus epsilon, for example, in the simplest case. So let's first think how that behaves. How does it behave? First of all, if epsilon is positive, then this is a completely normal convergent integral. And we can compute the result. Uh, the integral of this function here is one over epsilon times t to the power epsilon. And if epsilon, and this should be evaluated at the limits zero and one. If epsilon is positive, then this is completely well defined and finite, and the result is just one over epsilon. So this is completely convergent for epsilon positive. So in dimensional regularization, when we have such a logarithmically divergent integral, then actually uh, we will get a one over epsilon pole, as we have already seen in examples. And uh, here in this way of dealing with the integral, we do not see a logarithmic divergence. It is just translated into a one over epsilon pole. Okay. We should now discuss the convergence and divergence behavior of this and similar integrals in a more generalized form. So you see by looking at the left hand side, this is uh, defined by an integral which is completely finite for all epsilon positive, but the integral is undefined for epsilon zero or negative. On the right hand side, you see a result one over epsilon. This is defined for all epsilon uh, which are non-zero, even for complex epsilon. So the right-hand side has a bigger range of definition than the left-hand side, and what that means is that we can analytically continue the function which is defined by the integral. So we might say this defines a function f of epsilon, and at first the definition is only valid for positive epsilon, but this defines a function f of epsilon, which is defined for all epsilon in the complex plane. The functions are the same for positive epsilon. And uh, that means the right-hand side defines an analytic continuation of the left-hand side. So this is, uh, and then you see this function, which is defined uh, at first only for a part of the um, epsilon range can be analytically continued. And then in the analytic continuation, we see poles in epsilon. And these are what we are interested in. So let us now do something more general. So let uh, us give us a function g of t, which is infinitely many times uh, differentiable in the range zero to infinity. And it is not only integrable, but uh, it decays exponentially at least. So for t going to infinity, it goes to zero exponentially fast.
That means t uh, g of t times any polynomial still uh, goes to zero and is um, integrable. So it either goes to zero exponentially fast or it contains, for example, a theta function, one minus t. So this theta function would mean that for t bigger than one, the function just vanishes. That is also okay. Then once we have such a function, we can define f of a variable z is defined as the integral from zero to infinity dt, t to the power z minus one times this function g of t. And you see that this is a generalization of that integral. Here we had just a one as a factor and we integrate it from zero to one. And it's also a generalization of the gamma function because the gamma function would simply have here e to the minus t, which is exponentially decaying. And here we have a general function g of t which decays exponentially and we integrate like this so the integral is certainly well defined. So this integral converges for all uh, z bigger than zero. Because then at the upper integration limit, uh, this converges because of the exponential decay. And at the lower integration limit, this is continuous and differentiable. So it goes to at most to some constant. And this behaves uh, better than one over t, therefore it's integrable. So the integral converges and it defines a function f of z for all um, z positive. Now can we also define an analytic continuation of that function, similar to what happened here, where we see maybe single poles in terms of z for negative z, but which uh, unambiguously corresponds to an analytic continuation of this function. Yes, we can do that, and we can do this in the following way. Maybe I'll use the upper blackboard. So let's rewrite it. This function f of z can be written in the following way. So we introduce a zero into the integrand dt, t to the power z minus one. And then we have here first our g of t. And then we first subtract and, and then add back something theta of one minus t times, uh, let's do it uh, immediately in a general way, sum over k from zero to some integer n over the Taylor polynomial g k. This is the case derivative of the function g evaluated at zero divided by k factorial times t to the power k. Okay, so this thing here is the Taylor polynomial of the function g. It was infinitely many times differentiable. Therefore, it has a Taylor polynomial up to order n. And so here we subtract this Taylor polynomial up to this order from the function. Okay. Close the bracket. Close the bracket. So now we have subtracted something and we need to add it back to make it uh, equal. So we can add it back. Now you see that uh, each individual term here can be integrated. Each individual term behaves in the same way as before. We have here t to some power times t to another power. And we integrate only from 0 to 1. So all these integrals can actually be computed. So we can compute the integrals and add the result back. k from 0 to n, g k derivative at 0 divided by k factorial. This is just a prefactorial constant. Only uh, the polynomial depends on t. So what is the result of the integral? t to the power z minus 1 plus k. So you get uh, divided by z plus k. And then uh, the integral is t to the power k plus z, we put in the limits 1 and 0, so we get 1 
in the numerator. So we get this. Now we need to ask, have these integrals actually been well defined? Have they converged? So when do these integrals converge? So for the integrals to converge, we need to have that the exponent t to the z minus 1 plus k, that should be positive. Uh, sorry, uh, not positive, but um, bigger than minus 1. If it's bigger than minus 1, then the integral converges at the lower limit. And uh, at 1, anyway, it converges. So this converges and is equal to f of z as required for z bigger than um, 0 and n any integer positive or 0. So you can take as high a Taylor polynomial as you want and it always converges because this always improves the convergence of the integral. So we have rewritten our function in an equivalent way in a certain range of definition. Actually, in the full range of definition, we have rewritten it. But now what is the property of the right-hand side? The property of the right-hand side is a much improved integral because this integral now, how does the square bracket behave? The square bracket on its own behaves now in the following way. So since we take here g and subtract the Taylor polynomial up to order t to the n, it means for small t, this behaves at least like t to the n plus 1. Because we subtract the Taylor polynomial. So for small t, it behaves like a polynomial t to the power n minus 1. That means if we integrate t to that power times the square bracket at the integration limit 0, this thing behaves like t to the power z minus 1 plus n plus 1. So this has a much improved range of convergence. This integral on its own converges if z plus n is bigger than minus 1. That means z can be uh, even negative. Okay. And the integral also converges at the upper limit because at the upper limit uh, this thing happens at uh, t bigger than 1. This drops out because of the theta function. And then anyway this integral always converges if we go to infinity. And at t equal 1, of course, nothing happens because this is a polynomial. Therefore, the right-hand side, and OK, the first line of the right-hand side, um, first line um, converges for all c bigger than minus n um, what is it? Minus 1, plus 1. So z plus n should be bigger than minus 1. So like this. Okay, so we have increased the range of convergence. And what happens to the second line? The second line is anyway well defined. The second line is a, a rational function in z. And uh, it is uh, always it is no integral anymore. Second line is well defined for all z, which are not element negative integers. That means we have analytically continued our function. So the analytic continuation is now defined by the right hand side and actually we can n was an arbitrary integer, therefore n can be as large as you want, 
That means you can analytically continue the function to the full complex plane by making n infinitely uh, uh, big, or as big as you want, bigger than any number that you can take. So you can analytically continue to any way you want in the complex plane by this formula. And uh, the result of this analytic continuation is a sum of two terms, namely here a regular integral, which is well defined, and the sum of single poles. So the analytic continuation contains single poles in the variable z at 0, minus 1, minus 2, and so on. Exactly like the gamma function. So, and uh, this is an important result, and um, let's put a box around this. This is the constructive recipe to analytically continue the function to anywhere you want in the complex plane. And so you have a pole part and a regular part which you can compute if you need to. Now, as a corollary, we can also make um, explicit the pole at certain particular ranges. So let's say around z equal minus n plus epsilon. This is what would happen in a loop integration. So we have a special dimension, uh, d equal 6 plus 2 epsilon or minus 2 epsilon and so on. So then we need to evaluate the integral around some negative integer plus epsilon. So n is uh, an integer or a zero, and uh, epsilon, its magnitude should be smaller than one. Then we can look at the formula, what happens specific for that value. Then, of course, you can choose n big enough. Then this is regular and well-defined even for this integration region. So if we have it now concretely here, z uh, is defined like that. Then indeed, z is bigger than minus n minus 1. So this criterion is fulfilled. So that formula applies. The first line is regular, and the second line gives us a pole. That means we can then say this f of z, and let me write the definition again, integral of 0 to infinity, dt, t to the power minus epsilon minus n minus 1, times function g of t. That was our left-hand side. Can be analytically continued. to the nth derivative of g at 0 divided by n factorial times 1 over epsilon. This is the pole part plus regular expression. Given by the above. Formula. Okay. So you can uniquely analytically continue. You get an unambiguous definition of the 1 over epsilon pole for z being a negative integer plus e epsilon. And if you want, you can even calculate the finite remainder by this formula. Let me just write here a comment for dimensional regularization. By definition, all such t integrals, if we have t to the power minus d, for example, times some other function g of t, they are analytically continued. d equal the physical dimension minus 2 epsilon 
in this way. And what we see in this way, the analytical continuation gives us precisely single poles in 1 over epsilon. Plus well-defined finite remainders. So this is how these T integrals must be treated in the context of dimensional regularization. And um, so that means if you are only interested in the divergent part, then you now have here from the upper box, you have a direct recipe to extract the divergent part of such an integral. So you do not have to calculate very much. So if we see a formula of that type, and uh, in the previous um, example, this was this d tilde, that remaining quantity, which was one plus higher orders in betas and t's to some power, so it's still a complicated function. Um, but the one over epsilon pole has a coefficient which directly comes from the nth derivative of whatever is the remaining integration um, content. Any questions to this topic? Then, uh, okay, so I don't know whether we still have time to do something else. Um, I think if, if you have some time, then I would maybe try to give you an indication of how the T integrals look like for concrete Feynman diagrams to give you a kind of intuition and some examples. But let's not do too many complicated calculations anymore. Um, let me deviate a little bit from my original plan. Um, let us do the following. Let us look at this two-loop self-energy for which we have the exact calculation with all details, including divergencies and so on. So if we calculated it, we obtained 1 over epsilon square and 1 over epsilon, and the 1 over epsilon was a non-polynomial divergence. Then we must do a sub renormalization where we have this graph with a counter term, and the counter term is obtained by minus the divergent part of the sub diagram, this self energy here. And if we calculated that, then that subtracted the non polynomial 1 over epsilon divergence, and the combination had only polynomial divergence, which could be cancelled by an overall counter term. Let us now imagine that we do all the calculation of everything in terms of alphas and in terms of these integration sectors. And then let us, for today, maybe uh, try to get the integrations that we need to do for all these three Feynman diagrams so that one would see in terms of alphas how uh, the subdivergence of this is cancelled by the other diagrams. So we should somehow see a similar structure in the integrals. So let uh, us fix the following plan. Let us um, get the Schwinger parametrization of everything. So we should determine 
the semantic polynomials u for all of them and the exponentials w for all of these uh, diagrams. Then let us go to some specific sector and introduce the optimal sector variables and then determine again the semantic polynomials and the w's in terms of those improved variables and then write us down the integrals. And then see how the integrals compare between this and the combination of those two. Okay, I would say this is a good plan that we can try for uh, now. Let us begin with the simplest graph maybe and then go step by step to the most complicated graph. So what is uh, the Schwinger parametrization? So here for this graph, we get minus i square because for each line we get a factor minus i. Then we have this usual factor which is mu to the power d0 minus d times 4 pi to the power minus d over 2 times i to the power 1 minus d over 2. This appears for every loop. Then we have an alpha integral d alpha 1 and 2 of u to the power minus d over 2 times e to the i w. Exactly. Let me just check. Okay. And uh, so I, I could just squeeze it in here. And maybe for later purposes, let us abbreviate uh, this loop factor, which always appears with some name. Let's call it, I don't know how I should call it. Uh, let me call it C, D. This appears for every loop. Okay. What is the semantic polynomial U for this Feynman diagram. Let us give the lines a label. 1, 2. Here also 1, 2. Let's do it of course in the same way. Then let's do here 3, 4, 5. Then to be consistent we should also label this 3, 4, 5. Okay. Let's do it like this. Then what is the semantic polynomial U for this graph? Do you know it immediately? So the semantic polynomial arises if you imagine uh, this quadratic form in the loop momenta. So do you remember or I mean what you need to do? Sum over all the alphas times the propagators, di times alpha i. And uh, the quadratic term in the loop momentum has a prefactor and that prefactor gives us the semantic polynomial u. So in the case of a one loop graph, this is just alpha one plus alpha two. Then uh, the exponent w, this w, how, how did it arise? This w was uh, in our notation minus j times m to the minus one times j plus k minus k prime, just to remind you of our notation. So then the m was the prefactor of the quadratic term in the momenta, alpha 1 plus alpha 2 in this case. j is the linear term in the loop momentum. So here the linear term in the loop momentum, how should we do it? I think I uh, want it uh, so you can either put it to alpha 1 or to alpha 2. So one of them has p plus k and the other one has just k. So in this case, uh, the linear term is p times alpha 1 
So j is p times alpha 1, so we get here p square times alpha 1 square divided by alpha 1 plus alpha 2. And this was the term without loop momenta in this construction, so this is here p square times alpha 1. So you get p square times alpha 1 minus p square alpha 1 square divided by alpha 1 plus alpha 2. And if you combine it, then you get here p square times alpha 1 alpha 2 divided by alpha 1 plus alpha 2. And in one of the exercises we had this, so w is p square times alpha 1 alpha 2 divided by alpha 1 plus alpha 2. And instead of calling it p, we might call it, let's say, um, q, which is the second loop momentum. Let's call it q square. Then we have it. This is our semantic um, expression for the one loop diagram. Now let's do it for the next with lines three, four, five. So this has minus i cubed times this one loop prefactor that we called CD. Then we have an integral d alpha one, two, three. The integrand u, now let's give it a name. Let's say this is u of the reduced diagram g divided by h. So I give it a name. This is graph g. This is graph h, and this is graph g over h. So this is the semantic polynomial for this graph times e to the i w of the graph g over h. Now what is the semantic polynomial u for this reduced graph? So the semantic polynomial u, you again have to start from the same formula. Um, so we now have three propagators, three, four, five. And the quadratic form in the momentum here, let's say here you have integration momentum q, q, q plus p. The external momentum is p and the loop momentum is q. And so you have here two times q, one times q plus p. So the q square term has the prefactor alpha 3 plus alpha 4 plus alpha 5. So the semantic polynomial is alpha 3 plus alpha 4 plus alpha 5. So it's like this. Actually, the only difference is that uh, alpha 3 plus 4 always appears in combination. The rest is the same as before. So if we go to the next step, then we would have here j. j is the linear term. The linear term comes from p times alpha 5. So we would get here p square times alpha 5 square divided by alpha 3 plus 4 plus 5. And k is the term without integration momentum, so that is p square times alpha 5. So our w is equal to p square times alpha 5 square divided by this m uh, minus plus p square times alpha 5. And what is it if we evaluate it? We get p square divided by alpha 3 plus 4 plus 5. And in the numerator here, we have alpha 5 times alpha 3 plus 4 plus 5 minus alpha 5 square. So what remains in the numerator is just, excuse me, times 1 times alpha 5. Alpha 5 times alpha 3 plus alpha 4. And you see, so let's write it here nicely. W is given by p square times alpha 3 plus alpha 4 plus alpha 5. Alpha 5 times alpha 3 plus alpha 4. So these two semantic polynomials are really the same, except that this alpha 2 is replaced by alpha 3 plus alpha 4, because one propagator appears twice. But with the exception that this propagator appears twice, this is the same kind of diagram as that one. So therefore, the semantic polynomials have the identical structure with a simple replacement.
and now for the two loop diagram. So the two loop diagram gets minus i to the fifth power because we have five lines. Then it gets the loop factor cd squared because we have two loops. And then we have integral d alpha one to five times the semantic polynomial for the full graph times e to the iw of the full graph. Now again, we need to ask what is our semantic polynomial for the full graph and uh, what is the W for the full graph. So the semantic polynomial we have already determined several times in the exercises and uh, both by spanning trees and also by explicit calculation. So we get this thing that each term in the semantic polynomial contains either alpha 1 or alpha 2 or both. And so we get this structure alpha 1 times alpha 2 plus alpha 3 plus alpha 4 plus alpha 5 plus alpha 2 times alpha 3 plus alpha 4 plus alpha 5. This was the semantic polynomial. So you see here alpha 1 times alpha 2 appears. Here we have both alphas from the subloop and every other term contains either alpha 1 or alpha 2. Okay. Now, what is the W for this graph? I think we had it once in the exercise, but uh, let us remind ourselves. Should we remind ourselves, or is it obvious how to obtain the W? Uh, okay. So let's save time and uh, simply copy it from the notes. And the result is... minus p square times alpha 5 square times alpha 1 plus alpha 2 divided by um, the semantic polynomial u plus p square times alpha 5. And if I evaluate it, then I get p square divided by the semantic polynomial u times overall alpha 5, then times alpha 1 times alpha 2 plus 3 plus 4 in a simplified notation plus alpha 2 times alpha 3 plus 4. This is this semantic polynomial here. So as usual, it is quadratic in the external momenta and overall it is homogeneous in alpha to the third power. Every term is proportional to alpha 5 and every term is proportional to either alpha 1 or alpha 2. And uh, some terms are even proportional to alpha 1 times alpha 2. Okay, good. So now we have everything. This is our first um, item. We have established the integrals in terms of the alphas. And now we could go to a specific sector. introduce the appropriate variables and simplify um, the integrals in order to extract the divergences. So which sector should we consider? Obviously, the interesting sector is the one where subdivergence. So clearly, we should take um, labeled forest here in the full graph where the subgraph is uh, one of the elements of the labeled forest. I mean, everything else should be boring. But let's start with one where the labeled forest contains this subgraph and the full graph. And then let's use as the label, let's, let's lose this line and that line. These are our labels. And then consistently we use the same sectors for um, the reduced graph and for the subgraph. As you remember, we had this lemma on labeled forests. So each labeled forest for a full graph implies a labeled forest for the reduced graph, which would now be that one here with this label, and for the subgraph, which would be this one with this label here. So now we have uh, labeled forests for all graphs, which defines for us integration regions. So for this graph here, the integration region means alpha 1 
bigger or equal than alpha 2. And the variables that we should take are, of course, let's say variable t. Um, alpha 1 is equal to t square. And alpha 2 is equal to t square times beta. This is the set of variables for this sector. Then we have implemented the corresponding inequality. And we have one variable t for the loop and a variable beta for the non-labeled line. OK, then for this graph here, we take this as the label. So it means alpha 5 is the biggest, bigger or equal than alpha 3 and alpha 4. So we introduce a variable. Alpha 5 is given by t, let's call it again tg squared, the t for the full graph. And alpha 3 and 4 are given by this tg squared times beta 3 and 4. Then finally for the full two-loop diagram, So we have two inequalities, one for the full graph, alpha 5 is bigger than everything else, bigger than alpha 3 and 4 and bigger than alpha 1. And for the subgraph, we get alpha 1. So this subgraph here, alpha 1 is bigger or equal than alpha 2. So the variables that we introduce are alpha 5 is given by tg square, so that is consistent here with what we did before. Alpha 5 is Tg square, alpha 3 and 4 are Tg square times beta 3 and 4, and alpha 1 is given by Tg square times T square. That is not the same as here because we have an additional factor Tg square, and alpha 2 is given by Tg square times T square times beta. So this is the set of adapted variables. And um, so as you see, for the full graph, we have uh, five variables, two t's and three beta's. And uh, the subgraphs and the reduced graphs basically inherit the same variables. It's the same variables we have now in all these graphs. And then we can look at the behavior and actually the formulas of the semantic polynomials in terms of these new variables. So let's do it. So here for the one loop sub diagram, what uh, do the two polynomials look like? So our semantic polynomial u, we can also give it an index u of the subgraph h, is now in terms of the new variables what? Alpha 1 plus alpha 2. Alpha 1 and alpha 2 are replaced like this. So the semantic polynomial is t square times 1 plus beta. And we could write this in the usual way, as we always said, we can factor out of the semantic polynomial each t to the appropriate power, so this is t square here, times a remainder function that we can call d tilde of h, and here this d tilde of h is 1 plus beta. It's always 1 plus something else, and here this is 1 plus beta. So everything is completely explicit now. Then our w is uh, here, q square times alpha 1 times alpha 2 divided by the sum. So we have t to the fourth in the numerator, t square in the denominator, so overall we get t square. And then we have in the numerator beta, and in the denominator we have 1 plus beta. That is the w. Then the reduced graph. our semantic polynomial u, what do we get? So here, alpha, everything now scales with tg. tg is the t for the full graph, so we get here uh, tg square times 
1 plus beta 3 plus beta 4. T3 squared times 1 plus beta 3 plus 4. Let me write it like this. Anyway, beta 3 plus 4 always appears in the combination, never individually, because it's really one propagator squared. What about the W? The W is here. So it's, again, it's essentially the same as for the normal one-loop diagram. Alpha 5 times the sum divided by the full sum gives overall P squared times T3 squared. And then in the numerator, we have alpha 5, which is 1. We get beta 3 plus 4. And in the denominator, 1 plus beta 3 plus 4. So as you see, it's the same structure for the two kinds of one-loop diagrams. So by the way, we see here that also the Ws have such a scaling in terms of the Ts. Now the two-loop diagram. U of the full diagram. This is, of course, now more complicated. So overall, here we have it. This has the following structure. So every term is proportional to either alpha 1 or alpha 2. And every alpha is proportional to Tg. So we get Tg to the power 4. As always, 2 times the number of loops. So Tg to the power 4 times T to the square. Because T corresponds to a one-loop subdiagram. And then, what is the remainder? So the remainder is now the one thing which is special is alpha 1 times alpha 2. Alpha 1 times alpha 2 gets an additional factor t squared times beta. This is alpha 1 times alpha 2. And all the other terms here at the top, they can be written as alpha 1 plus alpha 2 times alpha 3, 4, 5. So this is then alpha 1 plus alpha 2 gives 1 plus beta times alpha 3 plus 4 plus 5. This is uh, 1 plus beta 3 plus 4. Okay. So overall, this is what we have. Product of two terms of the form 1 plus higher orders and another term of higher order. Exactly the structure that we envisioned in general. Exactly the same structure. So this is a product of two semantic polynomials for the reduced graph and the subgraph which always start with one, and this is a higher order term. Exactly the structure. Okay, what about the W? The W is this one here. P square divided by this U of G. So, and again, let us write this. Uh, let's squeeze it in. This is Tg to the fourth times T square times a remainder D tilde of G. And this D tilde is the round bracket. And this D tilde G starts with one plus higher orders. Then we can write this in the following way. So W now contains P square, then one over the semantic polynomial times this. And in the ratio, most of the t's actually cancel. Because from the square bracket, we also get tg to the fourth. So that cancels in the ratio square bracket divided by u. Then from the square bracket, we also get always a t square. So this also cancels. So two power, four powers of tg and two powers of t cancel. And what remains is this one over d tilde g um, we cannot do anything with this. And then what remains is the rest uh, where these t's have already been eliminated. So alpha 5 um, gives still a remaining tg square. And then from this square bracket, we obtain everything without the t's. So here we have uh, alpha 1 times alpha 2. This again gives a special extra term t squared times beta. And then we get alpha 1 plus alpha 2 times alpha 3 plus alpha 4. This is 1 plus beta. 
times beta 3 plus 4. So this is well readable, yes. So if you compare the two, you see a very similar structure. 1 plus beta, 1 plus beta, then 1 plus beta 3 plus 4, and just beta 3 plus 4 plus higher orders. That is the structure. And now, okay, if we still have some minutes left, yes, let, let us just combine it to write down some nice integrals. So what you can see is, for example, a relationship. What happens if you take this uh, wg and you put t to 0? What do you obtain in this case? wg, t equals 0. Then you obtain this higher order term vanishes. What remains is this 1 plus beta times beta 3 plus 4. And in the d tilde, this round bracket is d tilde. Also, the higher order term vanishes because t is 0. So what remains is this. So what you get is that divided by this. Then the 1 plus beta also drops out. And so what you get is p square times tg square times beta 3 plus 4 divided by 1 plus beta 3 plus 4. And what is this? This is exactly the W of the reduced graph. Okay. So you see here already some relationships, which might be of interest for canceling divergences, because we need to look at the behavior of the integrals at t going to 0. And then you see some relationships between the two-loop graph and the corresponding counterterm graph. So this is just the first indication that you might uh, want to notice. But um, now let us write down fully the integrals, I would say. So this time, let me start in the logical way with the actual two-loop graph, which uh, should be the starting point, of course, because that is what we want to renormalize. So if we write down the result for the two-loop graph, this is now minus i to the fifth power times the loop factor cd to the second power times the alpha integral. And the alpha integral got converted into an integral over the betas, d beta and d beta 3 and 4 and over the integral dtg and dt. The integration ranges I don't write down, but they are always um, known, either 1, 0 to infinity or 0 to 1. And then we get 2 to the power of the loops, 2 to the power 2 in this case, times the appropriate powers of t, t, to uh, the number of lines, so tg to the number of um, lines, which was 5, uh, so tg to the power 9. Then the other t to the power of lines in the subdiagram, which is 2, so 4 minus 1 gives t to the power 3. Then the semantic polynomial u of the full graph to the power minus d over 2 times e to the iw of the full graph. And let us write one more step. Minus i to the fifth power times the loop factor square, then all the integration measures. Two to the square. And now, we can use our decomposition of the semantic polynomial. So here we get all sorts of factors of t, as we discussed before. Namely, this behaves like tg to the fourth power. So overall, we get tg um, to the power 9 minus 2 times the dimension. 
D. And the two means that we have a two-loop diagram. Uh, so G is a two-loop diagram. Then the variable T for the one-loop subdiagram comes to the power three. And from the semantic polynomial, we have T square. That means uh, T to the power minus D, so overall T to the power three minus D. And as we discussed many times, both of these correspond to the power counting. So the power counting of the full graph, uh, we have five lines and two loops, so this uh, 10 minus 2D. And uh, the other diagram has uh, two lines and one loop, so 4 minus D is the power counting. So it all completely fits. And uh, then we get the remainder, this regular function D tilde, G to the power minus D over 2, times the exponential function, which is of course also regular, but still with a complicated dependence on all variables. This is the integral. Now, that, what is this actually? So this is minus i to the third power times one loop factor times d beta three and four and the integral over the tg. Then we get two, because we have one loop, tg to the power, uh, what is the power of g? We have three lines, so we get tg to the power five. And uh, then our semantic polynomial of the reduced graph to the power minus d over two times e to the iw of the reduced graph. So if we, also rewrite it, minus i, uh, and then I should add here times the insertion, which is minus the divergence of the subdiagram. Let me insert it here. So anyway, we have this, cd times the integrations. So from the semantic polynomial, we can factor out one factor t3 square. So in other words, we get here t3 to the power five minus d, three lines and one loop. This is the power counting of this uh, diagram. Then what remains is the regular function d tilde of the reduced graph to the power minus d over two times e to the iw g over h times minus the divergence of the one loop diagram. And now what is actually the one loop diagram? The one loop diagram is minus i square times a one loop factor, then an integral over d beta and dt, factor two because we have one loop, then factor t to the power three times the semantic polynomial u of this graph to the power minus d over two times e to the i w of that graph. And the next step is then minus i square times cd, d beta times dt, two. And so from the semantic polynomial, we get t square. So we overall have t to the power three minus d again corresponding to the power counting, two lines and one loop. And then we have the remaining regular function, t d tilde h to the power minus d over two times e to the i w h. These are the three integrals. And now you should be able to prove, and maybe you can try to do it as a homework, that the sum of the three in the appropriate combination is a finite integral. Should be manifestly finite uh, if you integrate at least the variable t down to zero, which corresponds to the subintegration. And uh, so let me just finish by discussing a little bit the formula without writing anything else. What you see are some similarities and some differences. The similarities are good and the differences give rise to difficulties in the proof of convergence. So what are first of all the similarities? Of course, what is nice, many factors match up. So we have minus i to the fifth power, 
minus i overall to the fifth power. So this gets inserted into that, of course. So the minus i fits. Then this loop factor square, and uh, so the factors here also match up. The loop factors are also okay. Then, of course, the integration measures are the same overall. The factors of two match up if you combine these two. Then, um, the factors of Tg, they don't match. So here we have Tg to the power 9 minus 2d. Here we have Tg to the power 5 minus d. And here there is no Tg, so the factors do not really match. But actually, they do match because uh, if you pick up some dimensionality of uh, your diagram, for example, uh, four dimensions. In four dimensions, this would be t g to the power one, and this is also t g to the power one. And in four dimensions, the whole thing is logarithmically divergent. Then the factors match. Uh, up to the epsilons, which are present here in the dimensions. In six dimensions, they don't match. Here we would have uh, 9 minus 12, and here we have 5 minus 6, so this is minus 3 minus 1. But in six dimensions, the thing is quadratically divergent, and that means uh, we have to extract the divergence coming from some higher order terms in the variable t. And so, uh, lo and behold, uh, the factors Tg can be made to match by looking precisely at the dimension. So in order to get further in this, we should plug in really which dimension we are actually working in and uh, write d is equal to d0 minus 2 epsilon and then make epsilon small and uh, really fix our number of dimensions and then the um, further treatment depends on the number of dimensions. And then these factors here become a little bit, um, okay, I didn't want to write anything anymore. But remember that this power here corresponds to the power counting. So whatever you do, the exponent here comes from the power counting degree of divergence of the full graph. And here the exponent also comes from the power counting degree of the full graph. And that should be the same, no matter what you do in detail because uh, these are corresponding graphs. Therefore, overall, these factors match in the end, but what is definitely different is the appearance of the epsilon. So if we go away from our physical dimension, then we get here two powers, or yeah, let's say here four epsilon in the exponent, but here we only get two epsilon in the exponent. And that is a difference that we have to deal with. So in the limit epsilon going to zero, the integrands are not identical, 